I'm Jenna Bloomfield. I'm an anti-feminist blogger. I run a blog called judgybitch.com. I write for Thought Catalog. I'm the social media director for A Voice for Men, and I am the most active person on the Women Against Feminism Twitter hashtag. And Tori, introduce yourself um, as well. I'm Tori. I uh, run a YouTube blog under the name Awesome Rants, and um, since, I guess, early spring, I began identifying as a feminist. So we have the feminist and the anti-feminist here. Let's start off by talking about the uh, women against feminism hashtag. Janet, why don't you talk a little about your involvement uh, with that and what it represents to you, and then we'll have Tori respond. Okay, um, the women of, against feminism, I have a really bad cold, sorry, I don't normally sound like a frog, I just have a sore throat. Um, the women against feminism hashtag and Tumblr page have been around for quite some time. No, no, I'm at the Facebook page and the Tumblr page. And then after the Hobby Lobby decision, where feminism just shot itself right in the fucking vagina with that one, uh, taking an issue that trivial, oh, you might have to possibly maybe pay for your birth control, which I think is bullshit. I mean, insurance should cover it, but they were describing it as a war against women at the exact moment that Syria is happening, at the exact moment that Gaza is happening. I mean, like, look up rhetoric you fucking morons you just they shot themselves in the face and it just exploded all over twitter so i grabbed it and started running with it retweeting pictures retweeting lots of um information about uh what feminism actually does like they're all on there like blah 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 read the dictionary oh yeah i have a phd i don't know i don't have all right it. i'm gonna i'm gonna go ahead and jump in here and let tori respond to what you've said so far um I just, I don't know. I thought it was interesting that you thought that the Hobby Lobby case was trivial. It's very trivial. It's extremely trivial. I mean, what are you comparing it to? It's a war on women that you might have to buy birth control like men have to buy condoms. I mean, I, I don't actually agree with Hobby Lobby. I think if you need insurance, you should get it. But the fact that you might have to buy it, maybe, is not a war. Are you crazy? I mean, I, I personally wouldn't call it a, a war, but I think that it's a piece, it's not a piece of legislation, but it's it's a decision that was handed down by the courts that can really dramatically affect women in this country. And I think, I think the reason why Western feminists or American feminists specifically would be angry about that is because it, it affects them. And I'm not saying that if something, it, that if policies or cultural norms in foreign countries affect women there, that we shouldn't care. But I think it's important to care about you know, feminism issues in the United States because they do directly affect us. You know, and the thing about the war thing is like, uh, in America, people declare war against everything. Like, everything's a war here. It's like the war on Christmas. The war on gluten. Right. I mean, you know, so the war rhetoric, I mean, that's just part of the common American vernacular, in my opinion. Um, but I'll let you two continue with the, what you were doing. I just wanted to interject that. Right, sure, but as soon as you attach it to a movement that behaves hysterically and that just acts like a bunch of nitwits, and then they why don't you get why don't you delve into that? Delve into some of the ways that you think feminism, uh, the feminists, act like nitwits. Um, okay, like literally opposing equality. They're all like rah rah rah. We're all about equality, shared parenting. Fuck that. There's no equality there. We want child support. National organization of women actively, literally opposes equality sorry you can't say i'm for equality then literally oppose it and not have people call you an idiot yeah i mean i don't know i, I personally i personally just if if you are wondering um i do believe in equality of the genders on uh, all genders men women and non-binary identifying people um uh oh do you do you not like people who don't identify according to the binary gender roles in society? Um, I think that they are medically ill people that don't redefine gender. They need some medical help. Their hormones are fucked up. They're medically ill. They're not a different gender. It's like saying someone with cancer has a different gender. They're sick. They need help. Um, <laughs> are you are you going to include trans um, trans? folk in, in that not just non-binary identifying people but also trans people 
Absolutely. The reason they need surgery is that they usually have embedded ovaries or embedded testicles. Their hormone profiles are just a fucking mess. If your hormone profiles are normal, you don't identify as trans. It's a sickness. It's a medical illness that should be treated and in the way that the person wants it treated. It's their choice. But to say that someone who has screwed up hormones constitutes a new gender, I just think that's cruel. It's cruel. Okay, so that that term cruel, I mean, I, could you just go into the the implications of that? I'm just, I, I'm I'm actually interested, like in in like the moral implications of of you thinking right. that people who, sorry, continue, sorry, continue. Yeah, there, there's actually members of my family on my husband's side. The girl was born with Turner syndrome, no ovaries, right? It's mm -hmm. absolutely terrible. It's a serious illness. It's a birth defect. Her chrom her chromosomes didn't line up the way they were supposed to, and her brother, also even though he is externally male, he believes that he is a woman and wants to undergo sex change surgery, which I agree with 100%. I think that he is also ill. His chromosomes didn't work. Something in his DNA got fucked up during development. He deserves to have that fixed. He deserves every bit of compassion. But to say he constitutes a new gender is just bullshit. He's sick. He needs treatment and he should get the treatment that he wants, that she wants. Because really, Alex thinks that even though he's physically male, inside he is a woman and she deserves to live her life the gender that her hormones are telling her. Well, I'm kind of confused here because at first it kind of sounded like you're against the trans distinction, but now it's kind of sounding like you're not really against the trans distinction. So I'm, 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 I'm the trans distinction being considered a gender. It's not a gender. It's an well, ill person. Well, what there if you, I mean you're re, you're you're referring yeah. right exactly fine, but um, but when you're referring to, you know, your um, I forget what relative you said it was, but you say that he's he's bio, biologically male but internally female, and you are using the she identification. So I'm assuming that you believe he that you should be considered uh, female, yeah. right? He probably has ovaries, the, the ovaries his sister didn't get, which is just a cruel irony of fate. But this idea that there's a whole bunch of genders, no, there's not. Sorry, there's some ill people, and then there are two genders. Uh, no, I think, um, just to sort of clarify, I don't think that, tr that trans women and trans men constitute new genders, because a trans woman is a woman, and a trans man is a man. Um, but I, I don't know, like... A, I recently, I think within the last year, came across people who identified as um, uh, gender fluid or um, just didn't want to be referred to it as, as male or female and preferred they pronouns. And uh, when they were dated, instead of being a boyfriend or a girlfriend, they were called a date friend. So do you think that those people, I mean, I'm, is, is your opinion on those people that they're sick or... They're probably more likely assholes infected with some fucked up ideology about gender. And, and um, guess where that comes from? Where does all this fucked up ideology about gender come from? That's a legacy of feminism. Thanks, feminism. Wow, good job. So I have a question. Uh, it kind of relates, it kind of pertains to this... Um, you know, I, I basically asked um, I'm an audience for questions to ask you guys, and one of the most common questions I got is, you know, if, if both, you know, the MRAs and the feminists are uh, claiming to strive for gender equality, then why, why can't there be some sort of coalition there? Why is there no, you know, reaching across the aisle and working with the other side? I think people are really kind of puzzled by that. Like, okay, we both purport to want the same thing, but we're very unwilling to even discuss this with one another yeah. for the most part. That's funny you mention that because just look at look at our you know American Congress. They purport to be all about the interest of the American people, but what are they doing? Nothing really. So what do you guys think about that? <laughs> um so I'll 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 let Janet go first. I don't what is what is that you're holding, Janet? It's funny Canadian money. That's what it's about. It's about money. Yeah, I, I, are there are there uh, kids playing hockey on the back of the five dollar bill? Are there? There used to be. Yeah. There should be yeah. po there should be poutine in. There was at on one it. time. I remember. I was There's like, <laughs> it's no, it's the Canada arm. Oh, okay. We have some the really what? smart scientists. Huh? <laughs> oh wait, that's up here, right? Yeah, Canada yeah. arm for NASA. Okay, 
it's about money. It's really what it's about. Yeah. Um, how much money is being poured into domestic violence, which is, you know, it's theoretically it's domestic violence against people. What's it called? The Domestic Violence Against People Act. Oh, wait. No, it's not. It's the Domestic Violence Against Women Act. And how much money goes into women's shelters? How much money goes into that advocacy? How much money goes into administering that? And it leaves out men who are half the victims of domestic violence. And I will add the caveat that women get hurt a lot more because you know what? Don't punch men. It's really stupid. They're bigger than you. And if they hit you back, you're getting fucked up. But it comes <laughs> up to me. Tori. I, I, I don't think it's just about money. I think it's, I think it's pretty convoluted. I, I think a large part of the reason why MRAs and feminists tend not to agree on many things is because of the sub ideologues that make up each movement. Um, for example, um, MRAs, well, I'm not going to try to generalize too much because um, what MRAs are do, because I don't want, I don't want them to be um, angry that I, perhaps misconstrued them but um for me i feel i feel like feminism has a lot of sub ideas and 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 a lot of sub movements as well and mras have a lot of sub movements and they're not identical and they aren't um the like they can't be the same uh, under the same umbrella of I ideology uh, right they can say but i mean like i mean you've okay. seen in the past though that you know people who don't necessarily have to have absolutely identical ideologies in order to get together and work on certain things like i'll give you an example when there was this big uh when there, there was some mra conference at the university of toronto and the feminists pulled the fire alarm so that the conference was disrupted um there was a, a girl that was standing outside the event reading a list of um, mra complaints and basically saying that all of these complaints can actually be attributed towards patriarchy so I'm I'm sitting there thinking, well, okay, well, maybe you guys don't agree that you know, some one side says it's patriarchy, one side says it's not. If both sides agree there's a problem, isn't there still some room for a coalition to work together to address the problem? Or um, I mean, do you have to agree on even the infrastructure of how you get to that point of of thinking that idea? Well, I think I think that the the infrastructure of of getting um getting to those ideas actually has like it, it causes a lot of pretty intense emotions from both sides of the movement that I think prevent people from talking calmly and collectively and in a way that's actually conducive to progress um I think that a lot of feminists um sort of hold their ideologies to themselves um and this this is not some I'm not trying to like exempt myself from this judgment um, but I think that a lot of feminists hold their ideology to themselves as if it's as if it's who they are. And I think that some men rights activists likely do the same thing. So when you are critiquing um, the opposing movement, it's almost as if you're critiquing people or that's how it's perceived as. Uh, and I think that that can lead to just a lot of yelling and not a lot of fruitful discussion. All right, Janet, what do you think about that? I think that if all feminists were as sensible and sane and intelligent as Tory, there wouldn't be a problem. The problem is, is that you've let the screechy, man-hating, mean girl bitches take over and none of you more sensible, reasonable feminists have really stood up and said, listen, Jessica Valente, sit the fuck down. She posts a t-shirt of herself on vacation talking about bathing in male tears as a response to male suicide. Like really? That's the image of media feminism right now. They are Am I allowed to use the word cunt? I hope yes. so. They're fucking cunts. They're you can, cunts. Use, we, you you can use any language you want on the on the drunken peasants yeah, show. We have yeah. very little uh, we, we give zero fucks. We Is gives no fuck. Um Good. the Jezebel fucking bitches. Forty so, percent of them admit that they beat up male partners and they think it's hilarious. That's that's your mainstream feminism now. And you've let these witches take control of the cauldron. I don't think you can get it back. I think we got to move to egalitarianism now. So we have to so go towards humanism. Do you do, do you both believe that uh, feminism has changed, uh, you know, from its original definition, and and if so, do you, do you believe it's changed for the better or the worst? I I, I can probably guess. Yeah. <laughs> 
I think I think it's convoluted. I think that it was. I, I do think I'm gonna say I do think that it was more relevant um, historically, uh, but I think that currently, a large problem with modern pop feminism, I, I suppose I would like to call it, is that it's um, it's sort of reduced to these simplistic phrases and claims that are GIF worthy that you can reblog for the lols on Tumblr. And and you'll hear hear things like I, I think on um on your blog, Janet, you, you were criticizing something that um that feminists tend to say, and that is, let's teach men not to rape. Um and I think that's really um, that really epitomizes a lot of the simplistic language that modern pop feminism uses. Because I, 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 I know that if, if someone were to say that, I wouldn't think that they mean, let's literally, in schools, teach men not to rape women. Um, but I think that it's just, it's so easy to misconstrue because it's really simplistic. And again, it's, it's GIF worthy. It's, it's kind of almost for entertainment purposes. Um, and for me, I think that's the main problem with modern pop feminism. That's how but that's kind of the main problem with a lot of aspects of culture is that everything is kind of reduced yeah. to, mm -hmm. let's make it a sound bite. Let's make it something that you know, everyone can digest easily. I mean, you know, I mean, even I fall prey to that because, I mean, if you, if you do entertainment, you notice that, you know, if you keep things simple, if you keep things bombastic, if you always make sure that there's a lot of drama, a lot of flair you know, th then people pay attention. It's, it's you know, but it, you, you kind of have a trade-off there because if you try to do it like, I'm going to do the nuanced, carefully laid out argument, you know, eventually people are like, man, that shit's boring. When are we going to see some Why sparks? When are we going to see the pyrotechnics? When are we going to see the fucking explosions? It, it's very simple. It's like, you know, the... Uh, I, what's that? Janet wants to say something, okay. I can tell. I something. And, and this is something that actually, it was a conversation with TJ that helped me change my mind, that you could have done soundbite campaign about rape as long as you acknowledge that it's not just men who need to know what consent is women need to know too that you could have done this campaign right i mean that was my criticism is it's like you yeah. know it, it, why, why is it teach men not to rape why isn't it just teach everyone what can what consent is yes, you know i mean it, it, it wouldn't that be more fair or doesn't that you know not necessarily i mean if, if we did that with any other group of people, it would be like, you know, we need to teach black people not to steal. I mean, no. you know, I mean, like, if, if it was phrased like that, everyone would be like, oh, fuck that shit. You're, what are you, you're making some preconceived judgments there. But if you do it with men, then it's like, oh, that's okay. Well, everyone knows that men are the rapists. I, I think it has a large part. Uh, I think the reason why a lot of feminist sayings and maxims are phrased like that is because of the the model of a society that they work under the the framework of a society that they've sort of um, <coughs> constructed in order to understand cultural and gender norms mm -hmm. um, so uh, feminists um, tend to believe that uh, the reason why there is so much sexual violence against women by men is because of certain cultural and sexual norms that enable that sort of abuse so mm -hmm. um, when they say teach men not to rape uh, what they're really saying is that we need to stop contributing uh, through language and social customs and gender right. you're norms. Talking, you're talking about rape culture, right? I mean, people call it that. I think that's sort of like an inflammatory term, and I don't think I just don't think it properly encapsulates the the phenomena that does enable um, sexual abuse in our culture. But I guess you could call it that. Yeah. So Men that's and the... women are equally likely to be victims and perpetrators. The National Intimate Partner Violence Survey from the Center for Disease Control. The numbers of men and women who experience what constitutes rape are virtually identical. There's less than one-fifth of a percentage point difference between them. And yet we still don't see women being identified as as uh, rapists. It's like that right. blurred line. I actually that remember when I was, uh, I remember I was working in an office and there was actually a girl there that was like constantly sexually harassing me to the point where it was making me like extremely don't uncomfortable. Don't lie, TJ. Yeah, everyone, I don't lie. Everyone, every time I tell this story, people say that shit. But <laughs> no, I mean, like, she, she would go up, to, you know, she'd come up to me and she'd like stick her hands in my back pockets and like grab on my ass and stuff and, you know, and like then, rub up, rub her tits up against me. And it was like, I'm not interested in you. Just can you leave me alone? And of course, the reaction is like, oh, well. You, you know, T T J must be gay or something. He he must just not like pussy. He's not a real man. Because if he was, he would be after that. It's like no, I'm, this is just making me really uncomfortable. 
But and if I was a woman in that situation, I think everyone would be like, hey, man, back off. But because I'm the man, and she's the woman. It's like, what are you complaining about? Just deal with it. So, I mean, that's my personal experience with with being sexually harassed. Um, yeah. And uh, like, on, I'm, I'm honestly quite sorry that you had to deal with a situation like that. It well, it's not probably... a big deal at this point, but, you know, yeah, it was um, it, it was pretty sorry. annoying at the time. Yeah. Um. I think that uh, feminists try, um, I say feminists as if I'm talking about them in third person, but I, I do subscribe to this idea that um, in our culture, uh, men are sort of, I, I talked about this in my video, men are sort of perceived as, as the people who always want sex, um, who are always going to go after sex, who are always sort of, the, you know, the missiles of desire, like I said in my video, whereas women are, you know, the adorable kittens who don't want sex, who have to be sought after in order to get sex, as if it's a reward of sorts. Um, mm. And I think that w feminists mostly um, w would say that that you should, uh, that, that that problem is chalked up to the patriarchy, to right. um, gender norms that perceive men as more powerful and more sexual and women as less powerful and less sexual. Janet? Okay, it's interesting because that's a complete inversion of what the culture used to be, right? You can go back to the Salem witch trials it's the women who were the insatiable sex bots who had to be burned at the stake to stop them from like lusting after all male flesh. Um, but the reason that, oh, sorry, the reason that feminism gets a bad rap for that is because it perpetuates stereotypes against men while claiming that the ones against women aren't true. By saying things like, let's teach men not to rape, they're actually perpetuating that idea that men have no standards. Any disease-ridden, used-up vagina that presents itself, they're just on that, because men have no standards whatsoever. And that there's something inherent in manliness <clears throat> that really enjoys rape. And it's so wrong. And yet, at the same time, they're perpetuating this, like, Oh, I didn't really consent, and I was in bed, and I'm a little kitten, and he should have known how I feel, and I want enthusiasm. Oh, please, get my consent every step of the way. How about you act like a fucking grown-up? How about you be an adult? How about everybody acts like adults, including women? Act like grown-ups. It's not that hard, and that's where we're moving to. We're trying to move to this point that says you don't get to keep men as the boogeyman and keep yourself as the precious little kitten who can be stomped on. Everybody gets to be an adult, own their choices, own their decisions, own your own brain and your own actions. Just own it. That's what being adult means. Um, well, sorry, TJ, you're going to say something. No, I was, I was basically just going to ask you, um, to respond to that but with a focus on perhaps the uh, consent uh, segment because I think it kind of you know the, the rape issue seems like such a, a central issue here um, and it, it seems like maybe there's a lot of argument over what actually constitutes rape and you know how rape is actually perceived by the culture and what sort of social cues you know, have to be sent in order for consent to be uh, present. What sort of, you know, you know, there, and then of course there's a big question of like, can people consent when they're um, inebriated? Um, just stuff like that. Um, yeah, I think I think um, consent is a is a very big um, part of healthy sexual life. I mean, I hope most people would agree with that. Or, or you wouldn't. Okay. Um, well, I'll just often. I'll finish and then you can you can say why. Um, there's actually a video. I don't know if you um, guys want to watch it later or now or whenever. Um, on on a YouTube channel called Sexplanations that was started by uh, Hank Green, who also started VidCon, and um, uh, and another uh, sort of I think sex psychologist or something of that nature. Uh, it's called What Is Consent. Do you guys want me to link it to you? No, that's all right. We, we, I'm sure they can find it if they need to. Okay. Well, um, basically, it sort of uh, talks about how consent should be uh, a verbal, explicit yes and not just uh, the absence of a no. Um, 
And and the the truth is that in most sexual relationships, that's not how consent happens. You know, um, typically people consent by uh, kissing or touching or letting you take off their clothing or letting you take the next step and and then taking another step with you. Um, what I don't but, like about that, like, can I just interrupt? I'm sorry. Yeah, what I don't ahead. like about what you're saying right now is that it discounts the fact that there is such a thing as body language, that 60% of all communication is nonverbal. I think that when someone is passionately kissing you, when someone, when, you know, you're disrobing them, they're allowing, they're, they're, they're disrobing you. I mean, that, I think that it's pretty obvious that consent is present. I don't think that you really need an explicit verbal yes. I mean, what if you're mute for fuck's sake? Um, you know, I mean, it, it, I don't, I don't really see how how it could be misconstrued to that extent. Now, I mean, I understand that there, the 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 concern there is probably that there's some people who maybe you're not as good at reading verbal cues as others, but that's the kind of person that's so fucked up that they're going to to misread situations like that anyway, because obviously they're interpreting it from whatever selfish point of view they want to. I I also think though that um that what what's important to gloss is that. If someone is passionately kissing you, they, they really, what they are consenting to is passionately kissing you. Right. And um, when they, you know, put, put their hands down your pants, what they're consenting to is putting their hands down your pants. Um, right. And, but, I mean, as long as the other person's not stopping that and they, they're acting very receptive towards it, I think that you can infer, like, what we're doing in this moment is okay. Now what we're doing in this moment is okay. And so on and so forth. I so mean... It's like if I have the dinner at my house and then I put the, the plate on the table and I encourage you to sit down, I pour you some wine and I put the food on the plate. I haven't actually consented to feed you, so get the fuck out. <laughs> no, but I, I see I think that's what? very different because so if I if I if I um I'm not gonna use myself as an example. If a person uh says uh let's let's have sex tonight. If a person mm -hmm. says let's have sex tonight, yeah, that's like I, I would say that that's pretty equivalent to what, what you were saying, but if a person says, let's hang out tonight, and then, you know, you're in their bedroom, and you're, you're doing stuff, um, I, think, I think what's much more important in a healthy sexual relationship is to make sure that you know for sure what your partner wants and needs. I think that's much more important than making sure that you get what you want and need. No, I say the opposite. The most important thing is for you to know what you want. And when it crosses the line, communicate that. You are the adult. It's not your responsibility what someone else wants. What you want matters. If you went to someone's room and started making out with them, it's reasonable for them to think that you're willing to have sex. If you don't want to, speak the fuck up. Say it. There's one word. You know what? Biggest boner killer in the word. Here's the real word you need to use. It's not yes. It's not no. You want to kill a guy's lust? in one second dude if you keep going this is rape <clears throat> i just um oh, sorry i uh i just i think it's it's just so much more complicated than than um than what's being painted here i, I think it is i think all right a lot well, of hold, on, hold, on, hold on hold on hold on hold on hold on tori so go ahead i i, I want to hear about why it's more complicated um, because there are a lot of reasons why someone would be afraid to expressly, um, verbally say no. Um, you know, it can be, you know, uh, like, um, culturally, I'm not sure what word, like forced heterosexuality. Perhaps they're not mm -hmm. heterosexual. Perhaps they're, um, about to have a panic attack because they are remembering instances of sexual violence, um, mm -hmm. in their life. Uh, there, there are a lot of other reasons. And I, I just don't, I think that what we're doing is we're sort of enabling selfish ideas of sexuality on both like we're talking pretty abstractly so we're talking about men and women here and non-binary identifying humans um w like we're, we're letting them be selfish in, in terms of deciding other people's uh sexual experiences for them and just just because people don't say i just because people don't say no doesn't mean that they don't want it mm. But I mean, don't I mean, I think ultimately what we're saying is that I, I think that it's everyone's responsibility to to make sure that they are protected. It's not other people's responsibility to make sure that someone else is OK. I mean, it's a good idea. It's a good policy. That's how you should be. But should that be required? I don't I don't necessarily know that it should be, because, I mean, if you're, you know, being intimate with someone and they're giving you all the signals that they're, you know, reciprocating it. 
Um, I don't think that, you know, if, if they're actually internally uncomfortable and somehow just concealing it completely, I think that it is their responsibility to say, no, I'm not comfortable with this, let's stop. And if, if it proceeds any further than that, then yeah, that's, that's rape, that's sexual assault, that should be taken very seriously. But if the other person d doesn't vocalize because, oh, they're so emotionally fragile or whatever, if they're so emotionally fragile that they can't handle that situation, they shouldn't fucking be in that situation. And it's not yep. our prerogative to try to protect every single person from any sort of potential advantage being taken them or, from them or you know, being victimized in any way. That's not how any aspect of our society works. I don't think, I don't think we're going to uh, make much um, progress on this issue in terms of coming to some sort of consensus, but I, I, I really do strongly disagree. I think that um, healthy romantic relationships, uh, whether they're short-term or hookups or long-term monogamous marriages, um, I, I think that sex, I, I, think that, I think that consent uh, should always involve, and sex, should always involve um, and express um, typically verbal yes. So every instance, like, can I sit down next to you? Can I touch you? Can we go to this place? Everything has to be explicitly stated. I mean, should we break out a contract, too, so we can sign it and say, hey, it's okay if you to live, it, like, live in my house and be near me. I mean, just, like, where, 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 does, that, where does that line be crossed? Like, what is acceptable that someone doesn't have to give you explicit consent to do? Is it okay oh, for I someone to... Sorry. I'm just saying, like, I mean, is it, is it okay for someone to do the dishes? Is it okay for someone to be in your presence? Maybe you're more of like a, you know, you don't like being around people all the time. Like, do you have to <clears throat> define every single aspect of every single thing? Or is it, are um, you talking about in broad terms? I'm, I'm talking about sexual relationships. So that includes kissing, fondling. So a, 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 rela a relationship is only a sexual relationship? The other time is not relevant? No, but I think, <laughs> I think that, I, I mean... Um, sex is a physical thing, um, sure. and I think so, that there's so is a lot of communications. I want to get uh, Janet back in on this because okay. she hasn't had a okay. little. Basically, what Tori is saying is that I've been married 14 years. Consent is assumed in my house. What you're saying is that when I wake my husband up with a blowjob, I've actually raped him. I he he has a different opinion on that, <laughs> and it's not rape. Consent is assumed. You can assume that it's absolutely okay to crawl into bed with me with an awkward boner and wake me up with it because unless I tell you no which I will but only if like I don't know I'm sick or something because I'm totally down with that um, <laughs> consent is assumed it's assumed if I don't want to have sex with my partner I will say so well here's another thing I mean like since there's obviously two different standards here for what consent is like shouldn't you know, shouldn't so, so the people with one definition just hang out with other people like that and the people with the other definition just hang out with the people like that? I mean, it seems like there's just an idea, there, there's just a, an ideological barrier here about where responsibility lies that is just never going to be resolved because it just comes from two totally different value systems. So, I mean, well, like, I guess, th I guess the only know. problem is that w when those two kinds of people meet, and it's like, oh, well, you know, we're not understanding each other's intentions they'll, here. They'll probably have to err on the side of the person who wants that explicitly stated. Right. I mean, that's the only way it's going to work. It would not work the other way. But, but also, I, I just think that any, I think any um, romantic um, physical relationship that, that you enter into with anyone, there's sort of that, there should be a sense of respect, a, enough sense of, enough of a sense of respect to where you do sometimes it, it might seem like to ruin the moment when you say do you want to do the dirty right now but but it totally I think destroys it like yeah it just you just kill it it's boner killer and you know what the respect is self-respect it's not respect for the other person it's respect for yourself I think Don't it should be respect for both parties. Do. I think it should be respect for yourself well, that's, and for look, the person. That's just a philosophical that's difference. Just, that's just a difference in, in mentalities that's yeah, never going to be true. resolved. Um, mm -hmm. So let, I, I want to ask you, do you guys, are, you, are both of you guys familiar with Anita Sarkeesian? Yeah. The, a little moderately. Why don't moder you give them a brief overview? Because you know her pretty well. Well, I mean, that. basically, uh, sh she does a lot of pop cultural criticism. She's uh, gotten quite popular doing so. She's gotten a lot of recognition doing so, even from the gaming industry itself. 
Uh, and basically, she, you know, puts out videos talking about how there's, you know, troublesome or hurtful uh, tropes in video games towards women. And, um, you know, I, I find that to there to be a lot of problems with their standard. Like, I'll give you an example. Um, the old Tomb Raider games, Lara Croft, the main character, was quite busty. Um, Anita Sarkeesian said, oh, well, look at how busty she is. That's men sexualizing her. In the newer games, she's not quite as busty. So when Anita saw that, she said, oh, they took away her, uh, her big breasts, her symbol of her femininity. They've tried to make her more masculine because they just don't believe that women are tough enough to be main characters unless they've been masculinized. So, I mean, that, that, that just kind of, to me, exemplifies the impossible-to-meet standard. Um, what do you think about that sort of pop culture criticism? Don't you think that it could be applied to anything? Don't you think that it could be construed any way that a person watching it wants to? I mean, we have a guy on this show all the time, the vigilant Christian, who watches popular media and discovers that, of course, it's Illuminati conspiracies to serve Satan. Um, and, and I think that that's the problem with this sort of pop culture, you know, we're going to criticize things from this very specific ideological angle. Um, what do you guys think of what I'm saying right now? I'll start with um, Tori. Uh, well, again, I'm not, I'm not that familiar with uh, her work. But, yeah, I think, I think some people, in all honesty, some people do just want to complain. Some people do just want to see the world through the filter of their ideology or their movement or their political party. Um, and I, I'm not sure if she's an example of that. F from the way that you presented her, maybe she is. Um, well, let me just ask you what you think about the like women's representation in like media, like movies and video games and television and stuff like that. Do you do you subscribe to the idea that there's some problematic representations out there? And if so, uh, what would be your ideas for remedying that? I think there there sometimes are. Um, I think that. Uh, if, if a culture views women in a certain way or views men in a certain way or views something in a certain way, that's going to be reflected in the media that it produces. Uh, therefore, if a culture uh, sort of systematically uh, values women or places the value of women on their physical appearance, that's going to be reflected in films. So <laughs> if you're going to have better looking female actresses than you have, um, than you have male actors. Um, so I think that's that's sort of an example of that. Um, Wouldn't you agree, though, that the average male actor is better looking, as well, though? I, I mean, mean, I mean, like they're they're all pretty good looking. To me, yeah, if yeah. I'm gonna so. be honest. Right. So I mean, I'm just I don't know. I mean, I, I can I mean, like occasionally I'll watch Anita's videos and I'll think, okay, maybe she's kind of got a point there. But I mean, it, it usually I'm I'm just so bowled over by like the shoddy academic work and just how selective her interpretations of things can be. Uh, what do you, What do you think, Janet? What's your the take hypocrisy. on this? The hypocrisy is what drives me absolutely crazy. I'm like, okay, if you're gonna argue something, you need to pick one fucking side. You can't do both. That's what pisses me off. So here you have um, women showing up in at school with shorts, so short their labia is hanging out, and they got tight t-shirts on, and you can see the bra straps. And they're all like, "Don't sexualize me. I can wear what I want. It's hot." And then you get a video character with fucking shorts, so short her labia is hanging out, and huge tits, and they're all like, "Oh, you just sexualized her. That's all about sex." Like, pick one. Pick. One, you can't be such blatant hypocrites and not expect to be called an idiot. I mean, Anita is also a liar and a thief, which doesn't improve her in my view, but it's really the hypocrisy that angers me. You need to pick a side. You can't have your cake and eat it too she's and then complain that you're fat. She's a pop culture critic. Come on. She's an idiot. <laughs> Like, be smart. You can criticize culture in a really intelligent way. You can. She's just dumb, and her dumbness offends me. <laughs> I just, you know, I, I, I just like wish that it was... $30,000 videos the most. I wish that it was more open-ended is all. I, just, I mean, I wish that, you know, it was like, here, I'm presenting some ideas and opinions, but instead it's like, I'm presenting these facts about our culture that you need to recognize and be very concerned about. I mean, she should have a place in the debate for sure, but it's just like, like you're saying, it's like, I call it like... We're a right club. It's because it's just like when you watch the video, it's like, you know, we're right. And that's it. It's like a it's basically open, shut, closed, done. 
I feel like we're totally dogpiling Tori here because she's very clearly thoughtful and, and intelligent and, and not a hypocrite and open-minded. I feel bad. We, like you're not a psycho crazed harpy. And I think that's what we came here for. So we're beating the crap out of you really. This is domestic violence. We're, we're like <laughs> cyber assaulting you here. This is really mean. No, I, I just, I, I mean, you know, um, I kind of just, I, I mean, I think, I feel like I've known a lot of feminists that were like Tori, that were, you know, very reasonable and seem sort of open-minded about this stuff. But then it's like, um, just for criticizing feminism, I feel like I'm constantly attacked. Like, oh, you know, um, and you know, it, it's weird because it, it's usually their attacks take the form of things that they purport to condemn. Like, we're against body shaming. But then when I say something about feminism, oh, you fat tub of shit. Oh, you, you fucking micro-dicked. Oh, banana fucking shoving up the ass, motherfucker. You're just deranged and evil. And, None you know. of that is untrue. Right. But, I mean, <laughs> but it's, it's all ad hominem. It's, but, I mean, it's, it's just, just like, hey, it's just uh, let's, attack, superficial. let's attack your body. Let's attack your sexuality. <laughs> it's a superficial attack. And, I mean, I how, how do they, I mean, like, how, I just, I, I kind of find myself wondering, like, how do they justify being that way? And when I see, uh, you know, people like Tori who are, you know, more reasonable, I'm like, how can you want to even put yourself under that same umbrella and say I'm a feminist too because to me yeah. the feminists on the internet are so just disgusting and vulgar that I, I don't even understand why anyone would want to even come out with that label I think a part of it for me personally because um, I, I didn't identify as a feminist for the longest time um, and uh, I, I was talking to a friend um, I think winter term of uh, like 2013 and um, we were sort of joking around, and she's like, so why aren't you a feminist? Uh, and, and I just talked about my ideas on gender politics, and she goes, <laughs> okay, you're a feminist. Um, and I think for me, a part of identifying with the label and, and taking the label on um, was because, I, I did that because a lot of people don't want to take the label on uh, because they connote it. Some people just connote it with a lot of the crazy people online, but I think a lot of other people also connote it with femininity, with women. I think that they sort of see something wrong with a movement that is trying to talk about women, that is trying to put the attention on women. Um, and, and some people might not like a movement that's trying to do that because they don't model society in a way that views women as a sociological minority. But at the time when I didn't identify as a feminist, I did sort of, I did see women as systematically oppressed, more so than men at least. Um, and yet I didn't want to adopt the term feminist because I thought that it, it almost gave too much, it, it, it gave too much attention to women. And, and I didn't want to be construed as, as wanting attention, you know? Now, Janet, I know that uh, from watching your headline news interview that you don't think that women are more systematically oppressed than men. You think it's the other way around. So maybe Absolutely. you could talk a little bit about that. Sure. The vast majority of the homeless are men. How, how are they less or more oppressed than you? The vast majority of male suicides are men. Male combat soldiers are men. Well, the, really? the, all, of, all male suicides are men, actually, so... Oh, right, right. <laughs> that is true. Wrong. Suicides are male. Right, Homes I got you. Are mostly male. Um, Women are actually more likely to attempt suicide, though. But not so, be successful. Uh, so men yeah, are just better at suicide. Men are better at... <laughs> yeah. Yeah, male dominance in the field of suicide. Woo. Hooray for male Gun dominance. To yeah. Gun to the head is slightly more effective than taking eight Tylenols and then calling 911. It's right. true. Yeah. Gotcha. Um, so in the in actual fact, it's class is the big issue. Money, money will determine whether or not you are oppressed by anyone or not. Your gender is not going to tell you anything about the level of oppression that you face in society. Race will tell you a lot. Whether or not you're a legal citizen will tell you a lot. How much money you have in your bank account, um, what your level of education is. You can't just look at any random man and any random woman and know anything important about the kind of oppression or discrimination they face. And that's not true. If you look at just any random white person and black person, you can tell a lot about who's actually suffered discrimination. Um, Gender so is not a meaningful distinction anymore. It doesn't tell you anything. Who, who, what man can oppress me? Bring him. I'd like to see him. <laughs> see, I don't think we're going to make much, much, uh, 
progress on on debating this because obviously we're coming from different um, modes of thought. There's not going to be a lot of there's not going to be a lot of prag progress. Period. No, no. So it's, just say how you. Th feel. This is not the consensus show. Yeah, just say how you feel about what she said, and and that's it. There, there's not going to be progress. Yeah, like no, we're not. It, no, this show is not going to end with you being like. I'm an MRA now. You're right. It's not going to end with us being like we're all feminists now. Wow, she really. Holy, she, I, I was like, on the. I was almost there before you started. But I, I actually did want to ask Janet a question really briefly. I, I wanted to kind of ask her about something that Tori said when she was talking about just you know there there needing to be uh, some group that's just specifically looking out for women's interests. Do you feel like there doesn't need to be such a group because there's just no ways in which women are disadvantaged at all? Um, no, what? but they're disadvantaged on, on a different axis, and it's important to look at all the people on that axis. Like, let's say, um, Hispanic agricultural workers. It doesn't really matter if they're male or female. If we're going to talk about that, we need to talk about the entire group. The group is meaningful. That if we could look at, on an axis of, say, ability, like we're going to talk about the discrimination that people with MS have. We're not just going to focus on women with MS. We're going to talk about everybody who has that. So there's nothing significant or important that gender can tell you about a person, except, and this is the part that, you know, it, people get really friggin' lose their minds over. Women actually have more rights than men. If you're going to look at a random man and a random woman, she has more rights than he does. How so? It's no longer a case of women needing their rights. I have every right I need. It's my son that doesn't have rights. His what rights? What, what rights what are you talking right? about? Yeah. How about the right not to have someone cut your fucking genitals when you're a baby? You do that to a girl, jail. You do that to a boy, party. So, Tori, uh, you're you're shaking your head there. How do you feel about that? Oh, uh, I'm nodding actually. I yeah. I, yeah. I, I, yeah. It's genital mutilation. I, it's wow. Well, that's, thank you for agreeing. Here's like another, a, big <laughs> another big Another big question. Hey, teach, that teach, you know who practices circumcision? Who? The Jews. Dun, dun, dun. So, I, I mean, like, I, there are plenty of non-Jewish people that are Right, especially in America. Yes. Yeah. But there's another huge right that men don't have. For me, the biggest triumph of feminism was giving women the right to choose parenthood. Roe versus Wade. Absolute. <laughs> Seminal would never have happened without feminists. We get to choose if we want to be parents. And that's life-changing. It's life-altering. And even when a baby is born, we still have two choices, whether or not we wish to accept responsibility for that child. We can not identify the father, which we are not legally required to do, and place the child for adoption. Walk away. No longer your responsibility. You can take a baby to a safe haven. As long as that child is unharmed, you leave the baby, you walk away. No further legal, social, moral, financial responsibilities. Men don't have that choice. Consent to sex is consent to parenthood for men. They don't have reproductive rights. Women do. Consent to sex is not consent to parenthood. Now, if we give men reproductive rights, athletes and movie stars are going to get laid a whole lot less. But average men are going to have a power that they never had before. And in my view, they deserve it. That's equality. How That's would you enact that exactly, exactly, Janet? Um, it's... At, at any point in the first year or during a pregnancy, a woman has to obtain a man's consent to be financially responsible for that child. If not, the assumption is no. It's active consent. If, if I'm pregnant, I need to go to that man. Now, there is a legal document that indicates you consent to children. Uh, that's called marriage. <clears throat> you, are, you are responsible for children born to your marriage. But... Just some random girl gets knocked up with an athlete's child. Why is he responsible for paying that when it was a child he didn't want, didn't intend? That's making men pay for women's choices. That's not equality. Pay for your own choice. Tori. Um, I'm not, I'm not going to lie. Like I, I read your blog post on this beforehand, and I think it's a complicated issue. I'm not well read on it. Um, I haven't – I mean, I've heard, I've heard the sentiment expressed before, um, but – like I think it's convoluted. I'm I'm I I'm pretty much agnostic on the issue. I do I th I do think yeah, like it sucks that um you should be able to choose whether or not you bring a human being into the world um and whether or not you have to take a part in raising that human being. 
Um, but at the same time, I, I don't think that we should dismiss the fact that in uh, on it, at least on state and um, municipal levels, uh, women still are sort of lacking the right to choose parenthood, not not in sort of express laws, but it's um, it's just difficult often and um, economically infeasible and dangerous for women to get abortions. Right, because that Republicans, Republicans like to put up a lot of fucking red yeah, tape and try to like, like, you know, you have to have these throw uh, monkey wrenches in yeah, the gears of a system of an things. issue that should have been decided a long time ago, really. And that um, sucks. It's so wrong. Choosing parenthood is just fundamental. But I just don't think it's a right that only women should have. Every human needs the right to choose parenthood. It's to me that's and, and you know what, whether you agree with that or not, it's incontrovertible that you have the right to choose and a man doesn't. You ergo you have more rights than men have. I know that uh we're approaching uh the time when Janet has to get going. So um mm -hmm. Let's uh, have a, maybe a closing statement from each side just to kind of talk and reflect upon everything that's been said here. Uh, who wants to go first on that? I will. Okay, Janet, you go ahead. Um, Tori, you, you give me faith that, that there actually are some really you know, kind, thoughtful, intelligent feminists. I work mostly on Twitter. I work mostly online. And these women are just like absolutely disgusting harpies, man-hating embarrassments for humanity and yet sitting here face to face with you i think that you're a really smart woman i think you're thoughtful i think you're clever i think you're informed you're honest you're not afraid to be a little bit self-critical but you're not the main feminist in the media and the media controls everything and unless you and your sisters are going to stand up to the screeching harpies there's no hope for feminism. There's none. It's gone. It's done. And maybe that's a good thing. It's time for humanism, for egalitarianism, for intersectionality, true intersectionality. But I have to say, I like you very much. And, and thank you for talking to me. Tori. Thank you, too. Uh, yeah, uh, still identify as a feminist. Um, sure. Uh, I, I do think that there are... <laughs> I think that there are underlying cultural customs and norms that do systematically oppress women. Um, Such at the same maybe you time, could delve into that for a second. Um, I, yeah, I do think that our culture uh, pretty routinely sexualizes women, um, objectifies them, if we want to use that term. Um, I don't think that women, um, in terms of like a cultural sense, I don't think that they have equal employment options all the time. There, a lot of studies have shown that you put the same resume with a male sounding name and a female sounding name at a person's desk, they're more likely to call back the male. Um, I think that those problems do exist. At the same time, I think that gender politics is convoluted and that um, people on either end and in the middle uh, suffer from gender norms. Um, but I really did enjoy having this conversation. I think it's always interesting to talk to people with different perspectives. And thanks for you guys' time. No problem. All right, I think we're going to go to a break and uh, let our you know, two callers go here. Thank thanks, you both, thank for both of you guys for being, being on. Perfect. Thanks for having us. Thank you, Bye, y'all. Bye. Bye. Peace. Peace.